Jake here with another video. Hope everyone is doing well. And uh, if you enjoy my content, please like and subscribe. I'm up to 154 subscribers. Keep it coming. I thank everyone who subscribed. Each video I get a couple new subscribers. Sometimes I lose a few and that's okay. Anyway, I'm not making money out of this. I'm doing it for a hobby right now, but it does help. Hoping to sometime, someday make my channel into a part of the left uh, tool for activists and, and so on. Also, I'm promoting it on Rumble right now because of YouTube censorship. They took down a video I made, like video before last. So to avoid that, I'm, I'm focusing more on promoting Rumble. I'm, well, I'm still on YouTube. So if you could uh, go over to my YouTube channel, it's we are many slash they are view. I'll provide a link. Uh, if you could just subscribe to that as well. Besides the room watching Rumble, it, it would help me out a lot, and I do appreciate it. Okay, this video is on the looming food crisis. Some interesting stuff coming up. First, the uh, thumbnail, Greta Thunberg. I uh, I posted this on Facebook last week or a few weeks ago. I got a lot of criticism from people. Um, I first found this thumbnail as far as I remember from Twitter. It was posted by this guy Steve Poikinen, who does uh, YouTube, or uh, now it's on, he's on Rockfin, Slow Newsday, which is really interesting, and also does uh, Morning AM with uh, Pastor Jardula, who's part of the Convo Couch. They have interesting commentary, sort of from a left libertarian perspective. Interesting stuff you don't find anyplace else. Anyway, Steve, I interviewed Steve about a year ago on, uh, on Assange. He's a uh, chair, president of the Assange Solidarity Committee in North America. He does some really interesting work, um, interesting commentary. So he posted that uh, meme about Greta on, uh, I, I believe it was him on Twitter. I got some really feedback, push, negative pushback from it. One person I know, an activist, local activist, who is a really great guy, good guy. I, 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 I've worked with him. Um, he was chair leader of the state Green Party for a long time, and then he was in the ISO, and now he's in the DSA. I'm not sure what he's doing. Great guy. I disagree with his politics. I think his politics are pretty much in a liberal direction, but you know, I, I like him a great deal. But anyway, um, he criticizes the Greta meme was, was reactionary. So you know, I want. He said, I want to eat bugs. I'm really looking forward to eating bugs. There's so many people have this reactionary take on Greta. And also people uh, on Facebook, the Facebook left, people compared Greta with, uh, with uh, 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 Kyle Rittenhouse. So he said, well, at least Greta isn't Kyle Rittenhouse. You're defending Kyle Rittenhouse. Like, what? Like, it had nothing to do with Ky Greta Thunberg. has nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse. There was this really dumb meme going around comparing, see, this is the left. And it showed Greta, Greta Thunberg. And this is the right, Kyle Rittenhouse. See, that's what we do. That's the difference between the left and the right. Which I think is idiotic. It's like that meme was idiotic. It's... Democratic Party uh, cultural war stuff, basically nothing to do with class struggle. So I think we need a deeper Marxist critique of what's going on. So there's this uh, a Canadian journalist, Corey Morningstar. Uh, she's, a, she's a leftist, she uses Marxist analysis. Uh, she's in solidarity with the indigenous uh, environmental movements in Bolivia. She got some award from Evo Morales in solidarity with, with you got some recognition from the Bolivian state, the Plural National Republic of Venezuela, of, of, of Bolivia, and I'm sure she's been there. She writes about environmental issues, and also she writes about the corruption and hypocrisy of the uh, the uh, official uh, official environmental movement, the corporate, how corporatized it is. She's done an expose writing, analyze, analyzing what's going on with Bill McGibbon's uh, 350.org movement, how it's close to the Democrats and you know corp a corporate agenda. Some pretty insidious things going on. Corey Morningstar insists that climate change is real, and yes, the stuff they're concerned about absolutely is real. But the way the ruling class or the corporate, corporate, uh, 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 corporate elite is dealing with this is pretty insidious. And she had wrote a book on uh, on uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, it's called The Manufacture of Greta Thunberg. A disclaimer, I haven't read the book yet. I've read reviews of it, and I've read parts of it, and I, I'm familiar with it, with Corey Morningstar's thinking on this, basically what she says. Okay, what she says, uh, first, Corey Morning, uh, 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 Greta Thunberg, it was no, her rise to global fame was not organic, uh, no pun intended, but she very quickly was an obscure high school kid who protested from the Swedish parliament, and she ro rocketed to worldwide fame overnight. She was heavily promoted by several Swedish environmental NGOs, pseudo-NGOs. Basically, these groups were 
uh, according to Morningstar analyzes, were essentially thinly disguised front group for Swedish high-tech investors. A group of Swedish high-tech investors led by Paul, Paul Pushkin to worldwide fame. And she says, Corey, as Morningstar says, you know, they're using her, some of the capitalists, the leader, using her for their own agenda, which includes like a green bubble. They want to talk about green bubble. And also on a deeper level, uh, they want to do like kind of what happened uh, under the pandemic, how the U.S. government, U.S. state reacted to it. There's the CARE, there was the CARES Act, which represented a $3 trillion transfer of wealth upwards the highest in U.S. history. Bernie Sanders, by the way, voted for it. He admitted that he made some excuses. They felt he had this shitty, shitty bill, but he had to vote for it. AOC probably voted for it. It was an unrecorded voice vote, but it was horrible. And you don't hear much about it now, but it was horrible. And it represented a fantastic transfer of wealth upward. Also, the lockdowns facilitated a greater centralization of capital. Small businesses went out of business everywhere, and Amazon and other big firms gobbled things up. And of course, global equity firms like Vanguard or BlackRock and so on bought up a lot of assets, and they are buying up global assets. So Corey Morningstar analyzes this, and that's kind of what's going on. And really, these people are not going to solve climate change either. They're dealing with it environmental problems in a capitalist direction, preserve the capitalist mode of production. So I'm going to read a few reviews to, just to get a flavor of this thinking of Corey Morningstar's book for, uh, from Goodreads here. Um, hold on. Okay, so Goodreads, so uh, this is, um, hold on a second. Yeah, uh, okay, they don't let you get to it right away. There we go. And... Uh, Okay, here we go. A couple of these reviews are really interesting. This is from Hir uh, Hiroyuki Hamada. He's a sculptor. He's a Marxist. I'm familiar with his work. He's a sculptor on Long Island, and he's a, he's a Marxist. He said, this is an important case study on how the global capitalist hierarchy behave in protecting its framework. A re 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 review of this book by Corey Morningstar. The meticulously researched content provides a great starting point. For those who wish to study the mechanism of our time in which moneyed social institutions function as hands and legs of authoritarianism of money and violence. For those who are familiar with the issues of our time, the book can provide a cohesive perspective to see through lies and deceptions embedded in layers of today's social discourse. I highly recommend this book, which can provide great insights to those who aspire to be part of a better tomorrow for all. There's another one here. Let me... Um, do, 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 do. Okay, here we go. The manner, it, it's hard to, uh, the manufacture of Greta Thunberg for consent, the political economy of the nonprofit industrial complex. We are introduced to the not so accidental phenomenon of Greta Thunberg, the current child prodigy and face of the youth climate change mo moment, movement. The climate change is real, quote, message is reframed for public consumption and rolled out at an international level using Greta and her global platform to sound the alarm on climate change. Blah, blah, so not one sentence of this new strategy represents the horrific impact militarism has on climate change. The new climate economy being pushed by groups like Extinction Rebellion merely repackage our oppression into emergency mode. This urgency becomes global so that governments, NGOs, and corporations will all direct immediate funding towards unlocking trillions of capital needed to save capitalism by further funding the new green imperialism. These youth are used and molded into market solutions to insulate a global elite. Celebrity-sponsored activism seeks to build a new industry in which NGOs, uh, the media, and corporate power collude to get people to support the very industries we should be erasing from the planet. The planet's most powerful capitalists lie behind these youth-led movements for climate change, helping to manufacture consent for the fourth industrial revolution to help quids quell resistance to industrial civilization. So it goes really interesting. It's a critique of uh, the, the, the uh, Green New Deal and so on from the left. Now here we go. After months of nasty personal smears of the right towards the Greta movement, this book provides a much needed genuine left analysis. Corey Morningstar excellently reveals the connections between the climate capitalist searching for profits and the youth movement. The story of Greta magically going from a girl sitting in front of the Swedish parliament to a global figure is, unfortunately, incomplete. Only a coordinated, well-funded media campaign could, uh, could, could, could accomplish this. 
Now, the youth climate movement is used as a political tool, tool to unlock capital for the fourth industrial revolution in a desperate attempt to save capitalism. This book crucially reminds us to win the environmental battles we have to identify our enemies, the capitalist eternal growth paradigm, and the elites benefiting uh, from instead of allowing them to repackage their efforts. Um, uh, let's see, one, one of the really interesting... Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, let's see, here we go. Yeah, here we go. Corey Morningstar's book is a scrupulously factual, thorough and detailed account of the creation of the Greta Thunberg PR campaign by a network of nefarious pseudo-environmental NGOs, multinational corporations, and pseudo-progressive foundations. This media spectacle is fairly ham-handed astroturf but the media-wide efforts to sell it has succeeded in passing it off as a distracted, fretful, and increasingly gullible public as a kind of grassroots movement to address climate change. It is nothing of the kind. Uh, it is really a fraud designed to usurp the real grassroots environmental movement led on the global stage by Evil Morales and the global peasant movement through such organizations as Viva Campesina, which is what Cory Morningstar counterposes to the, this phony environmental movement, Thunberg is sponsored by extremely malign, polluting, rapacious organizations like the World Economic Forum, the Omen Dyer Group, and other Silicon Valley high-tech media and energy multinationals, and the fascist NGO Population Matters, which is population reduction, kind of eugenics, to carry out the whipping up of public hysteria, encourage magic thinking and scientific irrationalism, flying the empty brand banner of, quote, science, in order to carry out an enormous swindle. And it goes on. Um, yes, it sounds dystopian, and it is. We saw it done in 079 with a mass transfer of assets from the working people's public funds to the super wealthy. And it uh, goes, goes on and on like that. And um, so, Cory Morningstar points out, you know, critiques the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution, which, uh, which is overhyped but basically calls for smart cities, smart houses, like much greater centralization, much greater surveillance and control of populations, and a massive uh, restart capitalism, essentially reacts to the deeper crisis of capitalism, the overaccumulation of capital, and so on. Uh, back in, I think it was 2017, I briefly chatted with David Harvey, the, the Marxist geographer, and he was, he and some others were talking, the panel at Left Farm in 2017, he and some other people were talking about, you know, how, the ruling class could remain the ruling class in a post-capitalist economy, like not in a good way. We could reach a post-capitalist economy, but not a good thing. And the ruling class could, you know, the capitalist mode of production would be supplanted as the logic of capital accumulation no longer holds, but the ruling class could stay on top in other ways, and this could be part of a way to do it. And Corey Morningstar and many other people have critiqued it, so we need sort of a deeper analysis of what's going on with, with uh, Greta Thunberg. Nothing against her personally. I personally like her. I think she's a wonderful person. There's evidence she may even herself be sort of aware of some of these critiques. Recently, you know, she, she appears to have dropped out of sight for a while. Uh, recently, she was trying to put indigenous people at the forefront of activism, not focus attention on herself or the global north. She, to her credit, she was making some good moves, and then she dropped out of sight. I, I, I don't know. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't followed her super closely, but I think she may even, and I'm not against her as a person at all, but she's being used, the big ring, like Extinction Rebellion. Corey Morningstar analyzes Extinction Rebellion, which is a youth, high school kids. It's largely astroturfed. They don't criticize one of the biggest global polluters of all, the U.S. military. They never criticize that. And they don't criticize capitalism. Basically, climate change can't really be dealt with under capitalism. These people like environment or do environmentalism within the logic of capitalism. So the ruling class will uh, remain the uh, ruling class. I'm going to adjust my thing a little. It's a little better. Okay, so in a way, the ruling class can remain the ruling class. Okay, which brings me to my story, the uh, uh, coming food, looming food crisis we'll soon be facing. Um... Back in July, there's this guy named uh, John Boyce. John Boyce Jr., he's the president of the, it was called the Black Farmers Association in the U.S. I guess a lobbying group, advocacy group for African-American farmers in the U.S. And in July or so, there was, oh, from start off, uh, last March, Joe Biden 
made a speech, a fundraising speech. He, he mentioned a uh, coming food crisis, and he blamed the war, the, 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 the Ukraine war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he's partly, partly right. I mean, nitrates, which are used in fertilizer, skyrocket in, in, in price, and a whole bunch of reasons. And uh, Biden, Biden talked about a food crisis, looming food crisis. He's not doing anything about it. So July, June, July this year, this guy named John Boyce Jr., head of the uh, uh, Black Farmers Association, was on conservative Republican Party-oriented media, Fox TV and some lesser outlets. I'm not a big fan of Fox TV by any means, but he, had, he made some good points. I believe John Boyce was on Tucker Carlson, but I can't, that may have been deleted, but he was on a bunch of other, like Sean Hannity, whatever. Okay, he said, you know, the, over the past year, from July 2021 to July of 2022, price of nitrate-based fertilizer and other resources farmers need other imports have tripled. It's gone up three times in price. And this is being passed along to the consumer. Uh, he talked about that Biden isn't doing anything about it. No, son, Biden mentioned it in his speech in March, but he doesn't appear to be really <laughs> doing anything about it. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, so you know, John Boyce complained about U.S. foreign aid. The U.S. is sending something like over, like, I think it's $60 billion to Ukraine, most of which will be pissed away. It's you know, going to someone's corrupt bank account or whatever, or weapons systems which are uh, quickly destroyed, and also foreign aid to Africa. Now, I oppose U.S. foreign aid myself for different reasons than the left does, rather than the right does. Uh, I oppose U.S. foreign aid because, break it down, half of all U.S. US foreign aid is extremely complicated to break down, but basically half of it goes to the military of various countries, authoritarian, vicious regimes, and uh, the rest... Uh, it overall goes to, the bulk of it goes to traditionally three countries. They are Colombia, Israel, and Egypt. And these countries have horrible human rights records. And now <laughs> Ukraine is probably up there now too. So I, I would be totally okay with abolishing all foreign aid. I mean, maybe a small amount of it may do some good. I'm very really skeptical of that. I'm okay with abolishing foreign aid for different reasons than the right. The right is against U.S. foreign aid. They say, well, we're too generous. All these people are bellyaching and complaining about us, and we're, we've been helping them out. Now, yeah, it's so much more complicated than that, as people on the left will, will understand. Okay, so anyway, John Boyce talked about his coming food crisis, and he's right. Um, interesting, they got, he got a sympathetic play from conservative media. The agriculture sector in the U.S. is more uh, Republican oriented towards the Republican Party, and I, I would doubt, I, I don't know for sure, I would doubt like John Boyd would be on CNN or MSNBC or NPR, which are more Democratic party aligned media, the weird duopoly, U.S. duopoly. So anyway, but having said this, John Boyd is largely right. The U.S. currently has an inflation rate of 8.5%, which is high by recent standards, historical the last couple of decades, pretty high. As I understand, reason why, combination of reasons, but again, the way the U.S. state uh, <laughs> dealt with the lockdowns, the pandemic lockdowns, 40% of all dollars that were printed throughout U.S. history were printed in that two-year period, from like, 2020 to 2022, something like that. And of course, there's obviously <laughs> going to be an inflation. There are, there are other factors as well, but that, there's going to be an inflation obviously, and deeper level, the U.S. industrial base has been hollowed out, they only keep some prosperity going by recurrent uh, bubble economies, and there's a deeper, you know, over accumulation of capital and things, deeper crisis of capitalism, and the system is like thrashing, thrashing along, trying to, you know, okay, anyway, so yes, so U.S. inflation rate is officially 8.5%, agricultural product, food products have gone up about 11%, and it's varied, especially meat-based products have really skyrocketed. And let me just go through my uh, notes here. And, uh... Okay, yes, so, um, yes. Uh, for, uh, sorry, the overall inflation rate in the U.S. is 8.3%. Uh, food became 11% more expensive in the period from April 2021 to April 2022. 11% more expensive. And I've definitely noticed that shopping shit's getting expensive, particularly for animal products that have had a much larger increase. So year ending in April 2022, beef and veal products went up 14.3% in price. Milk prices went up 14.7%. Chicken went up 16.4%. Um, eggs went up 22.6%. Uh, Plant-based food has gone up as well, but not by single digits, not as expensive. 
Uh, there are a bunch of, bunch, of, a bunch of reasons, usually given price gouging is a bit part of it, but also uh, rising fertilizer costs and uh, generally uh, climate change. Fox TV wouldn't, Fox News wouldn't, wouldn't emphasize this, but climate change, uh, a third of the country of the U.S. is under, has experienced drought conditions, and there was a horrific heat wave in Europe this past summer. This certainly had impact on food prices, and the, U uh, and the Ukraine conflict is part of it as well. There was a myth that Russia was blockading food coming from the Black Sea ports. That didn't happen. There was something of a stand standoff. It's been resolved. Ukraine was actually mining some of the har Odessa harbor to some of the harbor and blocking stuff, getting out. Russia wasn't. As I understand, it's been, been resolved, and Putin recently actually offered free fertilizer to countries in the global south to help tide them over. But however it plays out, there is a looming food crisis, uh, food crisis happening. Now, um, the agriculture sector is very complicated, and it's very hard to get like a breakdown of the political economy of U.S. agriculture. According to the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, 96% of all U.S. farms are family farms. But what that means is anybody's guess. Uh, so complicated to figure out. There isn't a clear-cut breakdown of what a family farm is. It could range from like somebody with a, what they call a hobby farm, somebody with a couple of acres, and somebody who does it farms part-time, raises cows or chickens, or does some farming part-time, or has a couple of acres. And you know, who main job is a teacher or a truck driver. I, I personally know people like that. Uh, some of my neighbors are, are in that situation, are, are doing that. It's fairly common. The family farm could be ranged from that to a family who owns like tens of thousands of acres. It's basically a corporate farm and all everything but me. Oh boy. Uh, so, like someone who runs like a corporate farm is a cor a family who owns like a farm of tens of thousands of acres, and is a corporate farm in everything but name, and there's everything in between. So it's really hard to get a breakdown of what a family farm is uh, exactly. It also, apparently, um, as far as acreage, who tills what, who controls or who'll till, who tills what acreage? Apparently, 60% of farmland in the U.S. Midwest. I don't know how the Midwest is defined, it's a vast area, but 60% of all farm land in the Midwest is rented. That is, someone's renting it, they don't own it, they rent it, could be a family farm is renting it, a private operator, or a corporation. I, so the breakdown is like so complicated, but having said that, where are we here? So yeah, hold on. Hold on here, I'm going to have to delete some of this, but, uh, okay. Uh, hold on, sir. So yeah, okay, so family farms are, you often see the statistic according to USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, family farms are 96% of all farms are family farms. What that means is anybody's guess, the vast majority of agricultural produce comes from corporate farms. There's a pretty alarming statistic and a pretty big statistic. I can't, I can't really find it right now, but the vast majority comes from agribusiness. Something like 20% family farms were classified as family farms account for 20% of agricultural produce. The other 80% are corporate farms, and they account for like the vast majority of revenue. I forget this, this is a statistic, it's pretty large. The vast majority of revenue from farming comes from uh, uh, corporate farms. Now, 
the important statistic is the um, market con which is called the market concentration uh, the, um, the the what's called the, the concentration ratio and uh, there's the the percentage of market share the top 40 firms in any sector in the US economy capitalist market economy any sector the, uh, the concentration ratio is the share that the top four producers of, of share of the market the top four producers have and generally above 40 percent is considered bad monopolistic it can be abusive like price fixing which is technically against the law in a lot of areas but certainly happens anyway and you have a couple of producers can have a vast control over the market so most sectors of the US economy the market ratio is the ratio is around 40 percent anything above that is bad agriculture sector it's way above 40 percent the, the share of the market the top four producers way above markets can, and they're pretty some, some pretty interesting statistics here beef the market share of the top four beef producers in the US have is 84 percent hog products like pigs I think coming from a pig the market share is 66 percent turkey is 55 percent soybeans 70 percent Corn 80%, almost termed all seeds is 60%. I'm not sure what all seeds mean exactly, but uh, the, sh the, the share, the market share is very now very concentrated. So a small group of producers and control the vast amount of agriculture that's produced. And uh, so interesting statistics. Also, some sectors of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. agriculture sector, some sectors, not all, but some sectors are heavily subsidized by the US government this is extremely complicated I didn't want to uh, uh, didn't want to go into this didn't want to go into it a lot but uh, basically if someone stays back to the 1930s essentially to help out small family farms during the depression but now bulk of it goes to corporate well connected small number of corporate farmers the vast majority of it goes to corporate farmers and um, let's see here Okay, here, so I found my statistics here. So, yeah, um, farm subsidies are ostensibly to help struggling family farms. Actually, massive subsidies go to uh, capital intensive farms, and they mostly go to soy, corn, and wheat. Um, okay, so um, here we go. Five major crops are subsidized the most they are corn, soy, or soy, wheat, and cotton. And cotton has a long history of exploitive practices. The majority of farm subsidies go towards products feeding animal, animal agriculture. So nearly two-thirds of government farm subsidies go to animal feeds, and um, only the vast majority of it go to these. Only 2% of government subsidies go to uh, fruit growers and vegetable growers. The vast majority go to feed for animals as indirect subsidy of the, of the meat industry. And the subsidies are complicated agricultural price supports, like the government pays farmers not to grow things to keep the price up. There was a complicated system of, of direct subsidies. I think they sort of phased that out. There's foreign aid. Foreign aid is a form of agricultural subsidy. Um, in fact, um, during, after NAFTA, the U.S. Flo famously flooded southern Mexico with cheap chicken products, Purdue, and other products, cheap food products, cheap soy, cheap corn, has put a lot of farmers in southern Mexico out of business. One of the things which fueled the, the, the Zapatista movement, the EZLN, also fueled increased immigration from southern Mexico into the U.S., a whole series of things. Interestingly, uh, the situation got a sympathetic writer from conservative media. I was kind of surprised by that. But some of the right-wing outlets had something on this incident, how the U.S. flooded particularly Purdue chicken flooded southern Chiapas with 
the cheap chicken products. Uh, the right wing, I go conservative media, talk to us. I'm not entirely sure why. I'm a bit puzzled when you ex wouldn't expect the right wing to have a sympathetic view of the U.S. corporate exploitation of the global south. But anyway, so where I'm starting to find my notes here. So it's a complicated system of subsidies. Uh, farmers overall get about twenty billion dollars in subsidies in twenty. 2020. However, the wealthiest 1% of farm operators received like uh, nearly uh, the bulk of it. Like, was it the richest 10% of farm operators got two thirds of all subsidies? A third of all corn grain in the U.S. was purchased by um, uh, Cargill and ADM. They got ma massive subsidies as well. So the subsidies go to a relatively tiny section of producers for your agribusiness not help out small farmers. I'm from Vermont, and there was a thing years ago to, you know, help out family farms in Vermont, like keep the character of Vermont, which I guess was a good thing. I'm not sure. It's kind of complicated, but so you know, it's kind of mixed. Usually, family, the family for the plight of family farms are usually used as a you know thing we have to help agriculture. But the concentration of ownership is very very narrow in the U.S. agriculture sector. Now, having said that, uh, family, I do. Family farmers are often in a difficult situation. Uh, the profit margin is very low. Often, it's very barriers to entry, very hard to get into being a family, being a farmer for young people. Uh, machinery is very expensive. The only way you can really get into it is by family connections. If your family is already doing it, otherwise, it's very, uh, very difficult field to break into. Unless you do some like a you know hobby farm or, or, or you know, a small hobby farm or something. A lot of people do that, but have a big operation, which you do as your main gig, it's extremely difficult to break into. And farmers are up against it, De definitely, <laughs> definitely up against it. So I feel sorry for family farms. Family farmers, it is a struggle for a farm, but it's a, it's a complicated situation. So my point is, though, agriculture is under a lot of stress. Uh, we are reaching a food crisis, uh, partly because of nitrates. Uh, it is due to, 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 to the uh, Ukraine conflict, not the fault of Russia. It's the fault of the sanctions, like literally Europe, European Union is not buying any natural gas from Russia. The last 30 years, Europe and to some extent the U.S. became heavily dependent on resources from Russia. And uh, like nitrates, uh, natural gas is a big component. We get the nitrates to make synthetic fertilizer that's used part of, of modern agriculture. So it's like Europe is undergoing like suicide, voluntary economic suicide right now. I'll talk about that in a minute. but. So this is jacking up the price of food. It is getting expensive. I remember for my, feeding my dogs like Little Caesar dog food. A lot of it is filler, but my dogs do seem to like it. It was really cheap. It went for 88 cents, like soft dog food, 88 cents a container. Now it's like $1.50 a container. Like shit's getting expensive a lot of ways. Okay, so U.S. agriculture sector is very complicated. So my next thing is the um, Dutch farmers. Dutch farmers, epic, last couple of months, epic protests. Ignored, as far as I know, ignored by most of the corporate media, uh, CNN, NPR, whatever it is, as far as I know. But uh, epic protests, huge protests in the Netherlands, and it, uh, of course, a solidarity protests in Germany, Italy, and elsewhere. This was kind of percolating and started around 2019, but really took off in July this year. Uh, the Dutch government cracked down big time on use of nitrates, uh, which is fertilizer. And also farm animals like urine, they, they release nitrates in urine. Now, nitrogen pollution is not connected to global warming per se, but nitrogen pollution is a problem. Absolutely, and nobody, nobody would say it isn't. It is a problem. It creates dead zones in the North Sea and is very bad. <coughs> um, but people say, even environmentalists say, this is, these measures are really draconian. It's something like... Uh, Mandating a I think between 40 and 70 percent varies from different parts of the Netherlands, but 40 70 percent uh, 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 less uh, livestock. They often mass slaughter uh, 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 cows and pigs, especially. Very severe restrictions on use of synthetic fertilizer, which is necessary for modern agriculture. It's going to put a large part of Dutch farmers out of business. Now. This is interesting because uh, the Netherlands, um, a, uh, they're apparently, the, they are the second largest food exporter in the world. Uh, uh, I was surprised to hear this. The U.S. is the first. The Netherlands is the second. Um, it's outside the cities. It's very intensely cultivated. Like Dutch people reclaim like what they call polders, reclaim land from the sea, from the North Sea. This goes back to maybe the 13th century, way, way back. 
and the Dutch people have been really good at this for hundreds of years and very intense very intensely cultivated uh, well um, apparently it's very intensely cultivated and the Netherlands is a major food exporter they're the largest meat exporter to Europe and the second largest exporter of food in general in the world mostly to European Union countries a quarter of their ex food export uh, goes to Germany and the rest goes to other countries Agriculture is 10% of the Dutch economy overall, so it'll have a, a devastating impact. And it's going to have an impact on the, the global food supply, just as there's a time when food supply chains are becoming fragile and really uh, under attack for the reasons I, I've already mentioned. Climate change, bad harvests, and, and, and nitrates raising and rising in price and things like that. So there's been enormous protest movement and a uh, huge epic protest movement all over. Now, uh, the gray zones, the leftist outlet, the, 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 uh, they have a sympathetic view of it. It's environmental protection, environmental regulation in the interest of billionaires, not in the interest of the common people, in the interest of billionaires. And you know, Dutch farmers say, you know, first, they, they have reduced fertilizer back, nitrate, nitrate use back in the 1970s was really horrible. The Netherlands was a huge emitter of nitrate pollution. They've dramatically reduced it from them. And uh, from then, and Dutch farmers say, you know, more of a phased in approach would be better. They want to work with the government, work for them. So they, they think of climate change is real, and they are sincerely interested in this. They want to work with the government, do a more gradual approach. But um, th what the Dutch government do is doing is really dr insanely draconian, like putting, I think it's close to a third of all Dutch, maybe more Dutch farms out of business. And it's just irrational, irrational situation. There's more stuff going on than this. There's, um, Grey Zone doesn't mention this, but there's some buzz. I'll post another article. Uh, that a uh, group of Dutch investors in 2017, probably goes back earlier than this, have what's called the Tri-State Project. A huge investment project. They uh, basically build a city, a megalopolis, huge megalopolis, let's say 30 million people, push 30 million people into this area surrounding, Am with Amsterdam kind of as the epicenter, but would include uh, Germany and Belgium, hence Tri-State. I, I come from the Northeast U.S., I think the tri-state areas, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, that's a tri-state area, but in Europe, this would be the tri-state uh, tri state city. I don't know what they're going to call it, but they're going to somehow induce 30 million people to live in this area. And part of this, they have to push, destroy the farmers who live there, get rid of the farmers. And there may be some other stuff uh, uh, going on as well. So the Gray Zone talked about this and some other leftist outlets. There's one article, kind of, I say, liberal smear piece, it mentions said, yeah, you know, night nitrogen is a really big problem, and we got to crack down, and we've given them lots of chances. And it says, well, the Dutch farmers, they're anti-immigrant. So what if they are? I don't know how they feel about immigrants. Farmers are generally kind of anywhere in the world. They're kind of conservative and nativistic, sure. But, I mean, say, oh, they're all anti-immigrant means that they're all fascist, and liberals don't have to care about them. It's a smear piece. I'll just link this article as well. It's a smear piece, a liberal smear piece, but there are solid critiques from the left about this, exactly what's going on. This is on top of the fact that in Europe, uh, in, Europe is facing a gargantuan energy crisis, energy crisis, the, the sanctions against, against Russia. They're not there. Nord Stream 2 is canceled, but Nord Stream 1 is also now canceled. It's almost like as if Europe is not uh, buying any oil whatsoever from Russia. They will buy it, of course, indirectly from India or other countries. Or it's going to be much more expensive. Everyone is predicting a major economic catastrophe for much of Europe, especially Germany. And it looks like it's probably on purpose. The uh, Recently, the RAND Corporation, which is a Pentagon think tank, this thing came out in 2019 and recently came to light which basically discussed destroying the German economy. This openly discusses provoking a war with Russia. This is a real thing. It's not a forgery. Uh, provoking a war with Russia to, you know, Germany is a competitor, a potential competitor to the U.S. It's not fully sovereign, but it may be reaching more sovereign. Essentially a competition between German imperialism and U.S. imperialism. So the U.S. could provoke Russia into overextending itself while at the same time destroying Germany. This pretty much looks a lot like what's happening. Although in Germany, Russia so far is, is, you know, their economy is doing much better than expected. The sanctions are devastating Europe. So there's some weird stuff going on. Um, so, so where was I? Went? Yeah, uh, Swedish, forget the name of the company, Swedish tomato producer, one of the largest exports of tomatoes in Europe. They're spending their winter operations. Like they, they grow t tomatoes in greenhouses. 
and they're just not doing it this winter uh, because of uh, cost. It's not it's not profitable. The cost of nitrogen and other inputs is just prohibitive. They're not making money out of doing it, so they're shutting down their operations. And this is happening in other agricultural sectors in Europe as well. So the energy crisis is creating a huge food crisis as well. And so interesting how this is going to play out. Uh, yes, uh, uh, so anyway, yeah. So finally, the uh, we have a looming food. One thing, by the way, this um, the, the Dutch uh, nitrate, the, the, the Dutch uh, the government laws against restrictions against nitrates putting farmers out of business. Um, it was, you know, the Netherlands has a central-right government. It's not a left-wing government or a government, you know, central-right politicians who never had any real interest in environmentalism. There's some other stuff uh, stuff going on, like I mentioned, the, the Tri-Cities Project. There's some other, stu other stuff going on. I, environmentalism is not the top of their reason for why they're doing this. They're using this, like I mentioned, as an excuse. Um, and it's happening in so many areas. So, yeah, so, um, far as, um, what is it over? Eating bugs go. Far as e e uh, eating bugs. This has been seriously proposed by the World Economic Forum. Now, I don't think the World Economic Forum, by the way, is a real thing. Uh, they were the European Management Forum, uh, founded in the like, 1970s. It was actually suggested by Henry Kissinger, of all people, suggested to Klaus Schwab, who's kind of an engineer, technocrat. He uses like social democrat, woke language, sustainability. Like I, 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 I did a video, a nice video on Nestle's. If you read their, their promotional literature, it's really slick. You see how many times they can mention the word sustainability in one paragraph. Sustainability is a corporate buzzword for a commodification of nature. They want to take it over, sustain it for themselves. They want to take it over. And you know, their Nestle's is environmentally very destructive. You see it's all over the corporate sector. So. This World Economic Forum, they're basically a lobbying group for global capitalism. Oh, so it's a conspiracy theory. Well, a conspiracy is just means the ruling class does things, and they do things all the time. So what they do is they have this great reset. It's a real thing, real proposal for major economic restructuring. I don't know if the World Economic Forum, the Davis Group, is actually the heavy hitters. They seem to be spokespeople. They're not really the heavy hitters, I, I get the feeling. But anyway, they do have these, these agendas. They do have a global transformation. Part of it is eating bugs. They see it's billed as more ecologically sustainable. That is, you know, eating beef. I mentioned how the beef industry is heavily subsidized in the U.S. and elsewhere. Heavily, and it is ecologically wasteful for as like calories produced for hectares of land and inputs. The calories are produced for human consumptions are relatively low. It is wasteful. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. And there's a lot of cruelty to factory farming. I totally agree. But eating bugs, I don't think it's the right answer. It's being put forward as a progressive answer to this. Uh, eating bugs, eating a large quantity of protein, supposedly can, can be manufactured in a short period of time, can feed a lot of people, can cure the world's hunger, eat, world's hunger, eat, have people <laughs> eating insects, eating bugs. Well, I don't know if it's the way out. First, combination of reasons. Um, insects have what's called chiton, C-H-I-T-O, when the exoskeleton has a substance chiton, which is harmful to people. It really just wrecks, wrecks havoc on people's immune system. It's also, in bugs have their own internal parasites, they have bacteria, which is harmful to humans. There's a reason why many people, many cultures in the world do think it's, it's eating insects, eating bugs is disgusting. There's a reason for that. When I was a little kid, I actually used to eat bugs. Eat, what I mean by like, uh, growing up, I think I was in third or fourth grade, I, I don't remember, but near where we lived, there was independence of supermarkets, like, kind, of, kind of like Target today, but this is before Target was a big, it was kind of like a Target type store, department slash food store, had one section which was a Japanese or Asian specialty food, one aisle, a couple aisles, one section of the store, and part of it, they had grasshoppers, ants, and so on, and my, I, I would, my parents would get that for me, and my parents sort of were weirded out by it, but also kind of got a kick out of it, I ate, I ate fried grasshopper. I eat chocolate-covered ants and fried caterpillars and stuff like that. Remember that. I wouldn't do this now. I don't know. I got to a stage where I stopped doing it. Maybe other kids in school thought it was gross or icky. I, 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 I don't remember what. But I kind of stopped doing it. My parents would get it for me. They kind of got a kick out of it. But having said all this, you know, fried grasshopper, fried caterpillar is Japanese, Japanese, Japanese specialty. But it's not a staple in Japanese diets by any means. People do eat it, but it's not super common. And... As I said, it is not healthy. Eating bugs on a large scale is not healthy. Like we eat shrimp, 
and eating bugs as compared to eating shrimp. They're both uh, uh, anthropods and, you know, okay, eating shrimp. But the big thing is we don't eat the shells of the shrimp. We don't eat, we eat lobster. We, we, we don't eat the shells. Eating shells can, can, can be dangerous. And there are, I think, reasons why generally culturally held that eating, eating uh, bugs are dangerous. Now, uh, a couple months ago, there was buzz going around, came out of the World Economic Forum, that refusing to eat bugs or thinking it's disgusting is racist. Like some traditional cultures, peasant societies, like in Cambodia and parts of Africa, they do eat bugs. But the thing is, more complicated than that, these are very poor peasant societies. When societies anywhere in the world reach a certain level of prosperity, they leave the bug eating behind. They don't do it. This is very poor peasant societies, but like the high culture of ancient Khmer, modern Khmer, they, they do not eat bugs. They never have. So, you know, so on the whole, I don't think it's a good idea. And when you get process, have to process bugs enough so it's, people can consume it, get the chiton out and all the whatever bad stuff in it, it's basically just processed food, just as much junk as anything else. So I'm not sure eating bugs is really the way to go there. You know, I totally agree some alternatives to beef or factory farming. I, I totally agree with that. But I don't know if eating bugs is quite the way to go. And, uh, okay, so there's this... Um, so there's the uh, Dutch farmers thing is for farmer the restriction on nitrates much of it is linked to the UN what's called Agenda 2030 which the World Economic Forum was a big proponent of that's complicated it's uh, environmental regulations and you can look it up online it's very comprehensive and I guess I'd be in favor of it I, I don't know I guess I'd be in favor of it it's very very comprehensive uh, I think it was done at the urging of Global South, uh, Nicaragua, and some other countries, and people say it can't be fully implemented under capitalism. But the thing is, these World Economic Forum and other people have selectively taken parts of this out for their own, I think, nefarious and serious agenda. In fact, there's a story the day after Global Agenda, I think it was 2014 or so, was passed, the Agenda 23 was passed, there was a party, the uh, World Economic Forum, they had a party to celebrate in New York, and uh, the CEO of Walmart was there, Bono was there, Naomi Klein was there, and anything with Bono or Naomi Klein, you kind of run the other way really fast. Um, the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein was really great. It's a masterpiece. I'm skeptical if she actually wrote it, but uh, I think my theory, pet theory, is Aaron Maté, who's now with the Gray Zone. He was the chief uh, research assistant for Naomi Klein when she wrote it. I have a theory he actually wrote it, but rated the part of rating it. But anyway, uh, Shock Doctrine is a masterpiece, but everything else Naomi Klein done is kind of, uh, she's constructed opposition, uh, so is Bono, phony crusades. But anyway, so, uh, so anyway, they had a big party to celebrate. So this is a little, with the World Economic Forum, including Walmart, corporate executives were there. A little weird. They have their own weird agenda going on. So I think we need on the left more of a critical analysis of some of this going on. And so one thing, yeah, we may be uh, designed to eat meat. Now I have a lot of sympathy for vegetarians. I I tried to be a vegetarian several times recently, I, several times throughout the years. The summer before last, I tried really hard. I eat like tofu and you know some seitan stuff like that, fried uh, stir fries. And yeah, you can do a lot with tofu, taste, you know, give it any, any kind of taste you want, it's like a meat substitute. But end of two week period, I was ravenously hungry, it just didn't work for me. I know people are vegetarians and they, they make it work for them, I, I respect that, maybe I'm doing it the wrong way. But right now I am kind of skeptical if we can take the whole human race on, a, put the whole human race on a plant diet. I'm kind of skeptical if, if that can be done, and maybe it can, that's great. Um, but I'm not, see, in human evolution we have big brains. Uh, there were several, we were descended from what are called um, Australopithecines, who are bipedal apes, basically apes who could walk on two legs. And once we got to walking all the time on two legs, it freed the hands to make tools. And there was like a complicated dialectical process. Making tools, you need a bigger brain, enabled hunting, you get more calorie. When you hunt, eat animal meat, you get more calorie intake. It's led to making fires and cooking. It was like you play the uh, Civilization game, the Civ 5 by Sid Meier's, you know which one goal you can get in a bunch of others and one task and work one accomplishment you make big fire and you can do cooking and you can do this and you can do that and, you know it brings so it's a complicated dialectical process and that we do know there are several times when the human brain dramatically expanded there's one large expansion I think between 200,000 
and 40,000 years ago, there's a dramatic expansion in the human brain. And my hunch, meat eating, so theory is widely believed to be a big part of it. The human brain is about 2% of our body, but it consumes 40% of our calories. You need a lot of calories to keep it cool, to keep it cooled down, keep, to maintain the brain. We need a high calorie intake. And that requires, in you know, ancient cultures, meat, a lot of it. And of course, people in colder climates need even more meat. So, um, I heard, so anyway, interesting, uh, Neanderthals were prehistoric humans, ancient humans. They were humans, they were not homo sapiens. They were different human species. Today, all humans are were the same species and the same subspecies, everybody on the planet. But we could say uh, Neanderthals were humans, but they were not homo sapiens. Okay, anyway, they were physically different. They were shorter than us, but massively stocky. And they had bigger brains than modern humans. The brain seemed to be structured bigger. They had a much bigger uh, visual center. We don't know if they are necessarily more intelligent. The brain is like the, what counts for intelligence, the folds, the outer folds on the brain, not how big it is. And you know, we don't really know. But it's it's until recently, it's believed that Neanderthals weren't that bright. Recent evidence, maybe they were pretty intelligent. It looks like they did have cave art. They were fairly sophisticated intelligent. We don't really know. Anyway, we don't even know what happened to them. Uh, one theory is they may have actually been absorbed by modern Homo sapiens. We, our ancestors, humans, came into Europe and Asia and absorbed them. May have a mixture of crowded them out and also absorbed them. We don't know. All modern humans out of Africa are part Neanderthal, by the way. Uh, I'm like 23 in me gene test, genetic testing. I'm like, I have 446 Neanderthal fragments. I have no idea what that means, but I am a small amount of Neanderthal. All modern humans in Europe and out of Africa, non-African humans have some tiny Neanderthal ancestry. Some people in Europe, uh, in Africa as well, people in West Nigeria have been found to have some trace amounts of Neanderthal ancestry, probably through back, back breeding, whatever, Africa was not as isolated as we thought. Anyway, so my point is Neanderthals practice cannibalism on a massive basis, not just once in a while, it's like they did it all the time. They literally eat their dead. They apparently eat their dead. They eat modern humans. They practice cannibalism a lot, and it would make sense in their case. Not, I don't think cannibalism is a good thing to do for a variety of reasons, but it would make sense. Neanderthals had bigger brains. They required a much bigger calorie intake. Plus, they lived in Europe during the, and, and Asia, well, well into Siberia, actually, probably into China as well. The epicenter seems to be Western Europe, but they lived well into Europe and Asia. Well, uh, so they, uh, it was Arctic, sub-Arctic uh, temperatures. It was like basically the Ice Age, the, the, I believe it was the younger, driest glacial period when glaciers covered much of Eurasia and, um, and um, uh, North America, covered by, so it was cold. So the Neanderthals required a huge amount of meat. They couldn't afford to waste any meat. So cannibalism would kind of make sense. It's not good for modern humans by any means. Uh, when you get the brain disease and prions, which are like a step below a virus, you get the brain disease from eating eating kind of a whole bunch of bunch of problems. I mean, I don't recommend it at all. But I mean, I'm saying in their case, they needed the Neanderthals needed a constant high level of meat consumption. And I think we're somewhere in between. Uh, I I'm skeptical of with a huge humans population it can be supported in a healthy fashion with by total vegetarians. I could be wrong. I'd be totally okay, I think I would be anyway, if we could create meat in a laboratory, like real meat, not a meat substitute, but actual meat, muscle tissue and whatever, in a lab, without having to you know, create beef or pork or chicken, without having to kill a, a cow or chicken. I'd be okay with that, as far as I know, although again, that would require more central, a central, it might require a centralized system too, so I, mean, I, I don't know. But anyway, so I think trying to transition people into eating bugs, and there's a media campaign, by the way, CNN has more and more blurbs of trying to normalize it. There are campaigns in Australia to make it populate chips made from bugs and trying to get kids, school children to more they, and eat bugs. It's kind of a campaign to normalize it. And I think, you know, they're ruling class, global ruling class. They're not going to eat bugs. I mean, the global ruling class, then Klaus Schwab is going to have his, like, the joke with a friend of mine, he's going to have his knock wurst and blah, wurst and stain and beer. He's not going to eat bugs. And his friends are sure as hell, they're not going to eat bugs. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett's not going to eat bugs. Bill Gates is not going to eat bugs. I mean, sure, but they're recommending it for everyone else. And it may not be the best alternative. So I'm just saying we need more of a sophisticated leftist analysis 
of what's going on from the gray zone or uh, Corey Morningstar and has, has, has some of our, our co thinkers. So, anyway, that's it. If you enjoy my um, my work, please subscribe. It helps me build the channel. And uh, yeah, my next video is going to be on um, on uh, uh, MAGA communism, which is the shit lips of the right. And, a weird uh, tendency which evolved recently. Anyway, hope you enjoy my work. Thank you and uh, goodbye.